with stories of strength and courage in the face of cold-blooded murder. A stark message is left for conservative leadership candidate Kelly Leach, as another contender warns against dangerous rhetoric. It's leading to cesspools of hate on social media. Plus, the Liberals abandon a major campaign promise. How can Canadians trust anything this Prime Minister has to say? It was a nightmare, one man recalled, but a nightmare he and others at Quebec's Islamic Cultural Centre want fellow Canadians to see in the hopes of stopping hate. They showed the blood, the bullet holes, the places people hid when a man burst in on Sunday night and opened fire. Along with the scenes inside the mosque came stories of fear, survival and grief that they told to our Alison Northcott. <laughs> The emotion was raw as people returned to their place of worship. Despite the bloodstains and bullet holes, some came back to pray for the dead. Amel Henshiri is also mourning the loss of what was once a peaceful gathering place. Now it will remind us that humans make mistakes, she says, that there are people who can't accept that we are different. Rashid Awam saw the horror unfold. Après les premiers coups de feu, Prayers had just ended when he heard gunshots. À cet -là, il y a vraiment, je te dis, une this is where he tried to hide, he says, along with 15 others. Dans ce coin -là. I was in this corner. I was like this to protect myself. He said the gunman said nothing as he shot at them. His friend was killed just steps away. His brother-in-law shot dead across the room. This still affects me, he says. It affects my heart because this mosque is my heart. Here, there are stories of survival and tales of heroism, like the final actions of Azadine Soufiane. He ran quickly to immobilize him, but the, the attacker uh, was more quick, and he uh, go back and shot him directly in his body, and he fell down here, he fell down, you see, here, as a hero. Saeed Akshor is now back home with his family. He was in the shooter's line of fire with nowhere to hide and took a bullet to the shoulder. Je l'ai vu. I saw him and he wasn't yelling, he says. It was like he was playing a video game in cold blood. He was a, a little guy. He was uh, wearing a coat, a long coat. Hossein El Manoug says he's certain he saw the suspect and spoke with him at the mosque days before the attack. He says he thought the stranger wanted to learn about Islam but asked for money. When his picture surfaced after the shooting, it was disturbingly familiar. I found that the photo, the picture of the guy, and that was the same guy. Because I, I, I had a discussion with him, and I, I, was, I, I could see him. He was the same guy that I met Thursday. Members at the mosque say they opened their doors today to shed light on their tragedy. Many say they will reclaim this space and pray here again. Now the community is preparing to honour the dead. A public funeral will be held for three of the victims in Montreal tomorrow. And Quebec City will host another service on Friday where thousands are expected to attend. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Quebec City. Joel Lightbound is the MP for Louis Hébert, the riding that is home to the Quebec Islamic Cultural Centre. He was with us Monday night in Quebec City talking about the victims, some of whom he knew personally. Today in the House of Commons, he offered his condolences, but also an apology. Aujourd'hui, je veux aussi leur demander pardon. Pardon d'avoir observé ces dernières années leur ostracisation et leur stigmatisation. D'avoir vu prendre racine dans le cœur de mes semblables la peur, la méfiance et la haine. D'avoir fait de mon mieux pour y répondre, mais de pas en avoir fait assez. Parce que si les mots ont des conséquences, Les silences aussi ont des conséquences. Plus jamais. Vous êtes à Sainte-Foy chez vous, vous le serez toujours. 
One politician who is not apologizing is Kelly Leach, the Ontario MP who wants to be leader of the Conservative Party, all but double down again today, insisting her talk of Canadian values and screening immigrants is exactly what Canadians want. David Cochran has the story. Anger over the Quebec City shootings was directed at Kelly Leach today as protesters climbed onto the roof of her constituency office in Collingwood to hang this sign, listing the names of the victims and calling on Leach to resign. Do you have any words that you feel you need to reconsider? No, I've been talking about a, a common sense policy. We must not be afraid to talk about our Canadian values. The issue is Leach's plan to screen all immigrants for what she calls Canadian values, which her critics say inflames racist and anti-immigrant sentiment. And while Leach is not digging just, in, her uh, opponents right, are speaking just, out. But I think there is a clear link, a clear result between the demagoguery we've seen, not just here in Canada, but in the United States and Europe, and the rise in hate crimes. We who are in, going into the position of leadership must be extremely careful of how and what we talk about. We do not want to sow the seeds of, of um, hatred in this country or seeds of division in this country. Leach condemned the Quebec killings on her Facebook page, but it attracted anti-Muslim posts to start deportation and send them all back where they came from, even referring to Muslims as animals. Leach says she isn't appealing to these sentiments directly or indirectly and resents any suggestion she is. But individuals on my campaign uh, are getting frustrated continually, and whether that be my campaign manager, but quite frankly, many of my supporters, but also many Canadians, don't believe that they are racist because they agree with the policy I'm putting forward. But this weekend, that same campaign manager, Nick Kuvalis, insulted an academic on Twitter, calling him a cuck, a slur most commonly used by the extreme right and white supremacist groups. Kuvalis later apologized for that tweet, and Kelly Leach says it was a mistake and not something that is reflective of the values of her campaign. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The Quebec shooting is still resonating around the world, today being recognized in the British Parliament. I'm sure that the whole House will join me in offering our condolences to the families and friends of those who lost their lives and were injured in the gun attack in Quebec City on, Saturday, on Sunday. A Toronto businessman has offered to pay for the funerals of the victims. Mohamed Faki also wants to help pay for any repairs to the mosque itself. Protests continue around the world and in the United States against President Donald Trump's temporary travel ban on immigrants from seven Muslim countries. Today, another giant of the corporate world joined the condemnation, albeit inadvertently. Howard Gould explains. You don't look like you're from around here. No Clydesdales or lost puppies this time. Instead, the company that makes Budweiser is serving up a Super Bowl ad that is an edgy immigrant's tale of struggle. I want to brew a beer. Welcome to America. You don't want it here. Go back home. When the commercial was being made, Anheuser-Busch couldn't have known it would be airing in the middle of a storm over U.S. President Donald Trump's sweeping travel restrictions. But it has chosen to run the ad, not pull it. Now, I'm all for a touchy immigrant success story. The beer company is already taking shots. Your beloved beer commercial this Super Bowl Sunday is liberal propaganda. But with so many multinational companies willing to take the risk of taking on Trump, it's hard to dismiss them all. Apple is even considering legal action. It's all underlining the politically embarrassing point that the travel restrictions make it harder for companies to do what Trump wants, hire people. Now I have to say to myself, okay, you know, what is the ethnicity of this person? What, you know, what about their parents? What about their relatives? Is this potentially going to be an issue? And that is bad for business across the board. This is unprecedented in, in at least in the last century of corporate America taking on a president. Marvin Ryder uh, teaches at the DeGroote School of Business in Hamilton, day, Ontario. Ryder says global companies need to attract and move around top talent. And they're big enough to do battle when others won't or can't. 
you know, if I'm a multinational company like uh, Apple, where I make my revenue around the world, I, I can take on Donald Trump without any fear. If I was a more regional company or maybe strictly American company, and if I sell more into the heartland where some of Donald Trump's uh, messages around immigration resonate better, I don't know if this is the one I want to take uh, a stand on. Be for my friend, please. The Budweiser ad has already been seen by millions online. Thank you. Whether it or any of the other corporate messages will have an impact on Trump's policies is a tough call. But it's likely much will depend on how it all plays with Trump's base. Welcome to St. Louis, son. Harvard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, as signs of hate proliferate, are Canadian authorities missing a major source? Far-right extremism has often been a second thought. Plus, she left the rat race for a life filled with laughter. Then, things got serious. The truth is, I believe that laughter is helping save my life. The Trudeau government crossed another promise off its to-do list today, but not because they got it done. You might recall 2015 was supposed to be the last time a federal government would be elected using first-past-the-post. Justin Trudeau said it a lot both during and after the 2015 election. You won't be hearing that anymore. The CBC's Katie Simpson has the story. Katie. Peter, the opposition seized on this broken promise, and the Liberals are making no apologies. The new Minister of Democratic Reform was sent to do the dirty work. Karina Gould confirmed the Liberal government will not be changing the way Canadians vote. And it has become evident that the broad support needed among Canadians for a change of this magnitude does not exist. The backtrack triggered anger from the opposition. I feel more deeply shocked and betrayed by my government today than on any day of my adult life. Well, I think Canadians should think twice about believing what Justin Trudeau says. It also prompted pointed exchanges in the House. How can Canadians trust anything this Prime Minister has to say after he has so blatantly and intentionally betrayed his own word. I am not going to do something that is wrong for Canadians just to tick off a box on an electoral platform. That's not the kind of the Prime Minister I will be. Electoral reform has been a problematic file for the Liberals after Justin Trudeau vigorously campaigned on changing the voting system. We are committed to ensuring that the 2015 election will be the last federal election using first past the post. A special committee traveled the country to discuss the issue with Canadians, and a majority of its members recommended a referendum on some form of proportional representation. The former minister in charge criticized the committee. While they did not complete the hard work we had expected them to... Mariam Monsef was later forced to apologize and was eventually moved out of the portfolio. Today, the Liberals maintain there is no consensus on the issue. The opposition suggests the decision was made for other reasons. This was not good for the Liberal Party. To have a proportional system is what one, I guess, concludes. Electoral reform may not be burning up conversations at dinner tables across the country, and some analysts say that may help Trudeau get past this blatantly broken promise. The multitude of issues that are happening you know, uh, in the United States with, with the new Trump regime are going to kind of take some of the heat off him on this issue and, may, and probably any other issue. With electoral reform now out of the picture, the minister in charge will be focusing on other concerns, like protecting Canada's voting system from foreign cyber attacks. Peter. All right, Katie, thank you. Well, this wasn't the first promise Justin Trudeau has broken since the election. Another big one, to run deficits of less than $10 billion a year and balance the books by 2019. There was also the promise to save home mail delivery and a promise to immediately invest $3 billion over four years to improve home care. The Liberals said they'd reduce the small business tax to 9 from 11 percent and that they would scrap the F-35 program. And today, Indigenous Affairs Minister Carolyn Bennett told the Commons that the government is ready to negotiate a settlement in the so-called 60s scoop. Between 1965 and 1984, thousands of Aboriginal children 
were taken from their families and placed in non-native homes. A $1.3 billion class action lawsuit against Ottawa has been going on for years. A 14-year veteran of the Calgary Police Service resigned publicly and in tears last night because she says of the abuse she suffered with the force. I have been bullied, sexually harassed, degraded and chastised. I did not leave the, the Calgary Police Service. The Calgary Police Service left me. It is with a heavy heart Jen Magnus told a Calgary Police Commission hearing that she now fears retribution and retaliation. She's one of two officers who filed complaints about abuse dating back to 2013. Calgary's police chief says he will not accept her resignation. Power crews in New Brunswick are nearly there now, almost done the body-numbing job of restoring power in the farthest reaches of the ice-coated province. But the work, like the ice storm, has taken a toll. The CBC's Harry Forrestell has the story. Under the cold dawn of the New Brunswick morning, dozens of power crews begin to stir. This, their eighth day of repairing storm-damaged lines. No small task. At the peak of this outage, more than 130,000 were without power. Now, just under 6,000. We're putting in 16-hour shifts. Everybody's very tired. Uh, this morning when we got here, it was minus 20. You know, uh, hard for the people at home without power. Absolutely, we realize that. It's hard for the workers also. The work is cold and grueling, replacing hundreds of poles that snapped like twigs under the weight of ice last week, 25 on this stretch of road alone. Well, I don't know, it's hard to say. There's a lot of work to do, but the good news for the people in Pigeon Hill, we're here, we're turning linemen, and we're ready to work, and we're all cranked up to uh, put the line back on. Down the road in Negwak, Joan Como hopes they'll be next. Her daughter, Carol, is autistic and unable to leave the home. So far, they've managed with the help of relatives and neighbours, but Joan isn't sure how much longer they can hold out. Hopefully for another couple of days, as long as the restaurants are open and i got a little bit of money, I can go and get something. It may be days yet before everyone is reconnected. For those who can't manage, the province is directing them to local warming centres and schools and church halls. There's food at the warming centres, there's... Uh, other types of medical support, uh, there are things that, uh, that can really help you uh, with the necessities that you would need during these difficult times. Some have opted to go it alone with devastating consequences. Emergency measures officials say two people have died and 40 others have been hospitalized with carbon monoxide poisoning, the result of using poorly ventilated wood stoves, generators and barbecues to stay warm. Harry Forrestell, CBC News, Fredericton. There's an update today on a tip line to fight tax evasion. The offshore tax informant program was set up in 2014. The Canada Revenue Agency says more than 20 informants supplied key information. There have been 218 audits and more than a million dollars has been collected in reassessments and penalties. Straight ahead, checking Canada for undercurrents of hate.
We want to spend a little time tonight on some less visible aspects of this week's two dominant stories. In a moment, the anonymous toll of the new U.S. travel ban. But first to the shocking Quebec City shootings and a hard to ask, harder still to answer question. Whatever might have driven that singular brutality, are there reasons to look for clues bubbling under Canada's placid surface? Adrian Arsenal has the story. We offer you our deepest sympathies. The flowers matter. On this, Mehmet Deje, the president of Adorval Mosque, is clear. They are appreciated now. They'll be kept. But there are darker keepsakes in his mosque, things cameras have caught. There's this one. That van pulling up outside the mosque as it stops, what you don't see is a passenger slashing the tire on the truck of someone praying at the mosque, stealing a bag from the front seat. Deje's truck, it's been shot up before. Attacks started in 2008, and they broke the windows, they broke the doors, so we had to change the doors. Instead of uh, insulation doors, we put steel doors all over the place, and they started to writing on the walls. Still, attacks did not stop. It is still going on. And arrests? Not one. Since Sunday night's massacre, though, the police, it seems, are much more attentive, and not just with his mosque. An arrest made in Montreal for hate speech against Muslims. An arrest in Toronto Monday for an online hoax that threatened a Toronto landmark. Police won't share details, but it sounds a lot like a conversation we found on the social media site 4chan a thread espousing white supremacy. Sunday, just hours before the murders in Quebec City, someone threatens the CN Tower. Some respond they're reporting the threat right away. Others simply urge whites not get hurt. Who's talking about killing whites, one poster asks, then links to a Muslim community event. The thread is vile, but does vile talk lead to violent acts? Victims and researchers seem to have a feeling authorities aren't all that concerned. Far-right extremism has often been a second thought, both in the United States and in Canada. And it just simply isn't treated with the same respect or concern that other threats are. On the face of it, he's right. Canadian authorities don't seem overly alarmed. CBC obtained a restricted document, a federal government threat assessment produced only days ago. While there are entire pages devoted to the intricacies of violent Islamic extremism, there are just a few lines about other domestic groups, concluding there's no indication that right-wing extremists pose a threat to migrants and, in particular, recently arrived Syrian refugees. Vandals spray-painting hateful messages on cars and on trains against Syrians and Muslims. To a layperson, though, the imagery of racist graffiti and KKK pamphlets and anecdote after anecdote of extremism add up. The numbers surely look concerning. According to Stats Canada, reported hate crimes countrywide based on religion went up from 2013 to 2014. The province with the most significant jump in reported hate crimes? Quebec. The most targeted religious group in that province? Muslims. So why? Easy to reflexively connect the far-right rhetoric in Quebec and the crimes, but not easy to prove it. Jonathan Montpetit has reported extensively on Quebec's swelling far-right movements. He's watched the soldiers of Odin on a patrol in Quebec City this winter, a group with roots in a European white supremacy entity, one of many. In Quebec, he sees a unique far-right ecosystem. There's also kind of a media sphere that exists. Breitbart style uh, websites in Quebec that help circulate negative stories about uh, immigration and Islam. But did that inspire a killer? Possible. Quebec knows that. For their part, Montreal police are hiring at least 50 more officers to look at online hate speech. Fresh eyes on what's been allowed to fester. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Toronto. Less than a week in, it's tempting to see Donald Trump's immigration ban simply through the politics of a country split in two. For supporters, a promise kept. For opponents, an un-American shrug to the world. But real-life consequences, intended or not, are piling up in real time for real people. The CBC's Stephen D'Souza talked to some of them. At his family's deli in New York's Lower East Side, Haran Zakari didn't think he'd get caught up in Donald Trump's ban on immigrants. It's difficult. And it just got worse, so it's just one big pot of mixed emotions. 
uh, not, not, I wouldn't want anybody to be in my shoes right now. Zakari is an American citizen. His family is from Yemen, one of the seven countries listed on Trump's executive order. Zakari was trying to get his wife and 13-month-old daughter to the U.S., but now they're stuck in Yemen, unable to complete their paperwork or even get an interview with consular officials. I'm 100% with preventing terrorists. I just feel like it's not fair to hold, to, to ban an entire nation just because of a, a, a group, a small group. I feel like it's not fair to rip families apart. With the stroke of a pen, Donald Trump's executive order closed America's borders to hundreds of people from seven Muslim-majority countries. Among those caught on the other side, hundreds of foreign students with valid visas. Let Saira come back to school! Let Saira come back to school! Students and faculty held a rally this week for Saira Rafi. She's one of about 120 students enrolled at the City University of New York from one of the banned countries. The doctoral student was visiting family in Iran when Trump's executive order came down. She was told by customs officers overseas she could not board a plane to the U.S. and was sent back to Iran, her future uncertain. Rafi's cousin is at this rally but afraid to show her face. She too is an Iranian citizen here on a student visa and she's worried that speaking out could make her a target. It's such a chaos right now. I mean, even if they tell her co to come back, you're not sure what's going to happen in 24 hours. She says their situation, however, is not as dire as refugees who've been turned back. We are the lucky ones that we are here. Those refugees that... Um, it's a little bit big, but you're dealing with it. They cannot go back. And I mean, we are the lucky ones that at least we are here. But like those refugees, they don't have any other option. I am an immigrant myself. At Harvard, Iranian-Canadian researcher Ali Kadam Hosseini says the executive order impacts nearly two dozen students working in his lab, limiting their ability to travel and visit family. I have um, always seen the um, United States as a very open and welcoming country and a place where one can realize the American dream. So I was initially very shocked. He says science often draws on talent from around the world and he worries the ban will force foreign students to look elsewhere. Just the perception that U.S. is a very open and welcoming country to researchers will be affected greatly. Um, and this is something that is much more, more of a long-term effect. At JFK Airport in New York, though, they're still sorting out the immediate effects. The dining area in Terminal 4 has become a makeshift legal clinic. Dozens of immigration lawyers are working round-the-clock volunteer shifts. The numbers have dwindled from the first few days after clarification from the White House about how the ban should be applied. But the lawyers still chase hourly reports of visitors being detained. One of the things that we're really focusing on is educating immigrant communities and immigrant families so that they can advise and better educate their family members before entry. The ban on visitors from the seven countries is supposed to expire after 90 days. Haran Zakari hopes once that window passes, he can get back to working on reuniting with his wife. No person, no matter of their religion, background, race, color, creed, sexual orientation, deserves to get the door shut in their face. He hopes that time will also give people a chance to reflect and allow President Trump to rethink the executive order and the effect it's had. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Now, as we mentioned in the introduction to Stephen's story, the new immigration policy has many supporters in the U.S. We're talking to some of them as well, and we'll bring you that story on Friday night. Right now, stay tuned for a look at the power of humor. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Keep that. She was really looking at, you know, what is the power of laughter? How does laughter change us? Is there healing elements to laughter? First, she made comedy her business. Now, laughter may be her last best hope.
I had been speaking about the importance of laughter. So here, here you go, little Miss Laughter Lady. Okay, let's just, you know, take some of your own laughter medicine. Stephen Colbert once had this to say about comedy. You can't laugh and be afraid at the same time. That theory is about to be put to the test. Faced with a grim fate, Catherine Lawrence is determined to keep on chuckling. She shows Duncan McHugh why it really may be the best medicine. <laughs> the chicken suit is her favorite getup. She'll use any excuse to wear it. Her mission, simple and pure, to make people laugh. <laughs> In our busy, successful lives, where we're running wide open, full throttle, so much of a race, let's bring the laughter in. Let's jump on the laugh track. <laughs> what pedestrians don't know, the woman inside the suit has a terminal illness. In fact, when Catherine Lawrence was told she was living on borrowed time, being funny became serious business. I believe it in the power of laughter to my very essence. The truth is, I believe that laughter is helping save my life. It began 20 years ago. She was juggling a career in corporate law with being a mom of three when she decided to quit law to pursue her dream, stand-up comedy. His job was to speak about the road to success. And the poor young man said the road to sex. <laughs> She'd often get together with old friend Phyllis Ellis to go over her routines. <laughs> My phone is uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. No, I'll be right back to the crosswalk. Yeah, <laughs> give me five. It's lunch. <laughs> I'm eating my banana. <laughs> she liked stand up, but what really fascinated her was how humor could heal. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Keep that. She was really looking at, you know, what is the power of laughter? How does laughter change us? Is there healing elements to laughter? And she started to explore it in a more serious way. So I watched her sort of evolve. So laughter became kind of her brand. She started giving workshops on how humor could benefit the workplace. She launched a company called Survival of the Funniest. Business was booming until she found out why she kept mysteriously running out of breath. <laughs> Catherine, Hi. how are you? I'm good, how are you, good Duncan? To meet you. What? This is Kevin, Duncan. Kevin, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know it to see her now, but back in 2006, her doctor gave her some very bad news. Can you say lymphangioliomyomatosis? Uh, lymphangioliomyomatosis? Wow, first time, sorry to you. Is that good? Yeah, you got it. It's also known as LAM, a rare organ disease that occurs exclusively in women, usually in their 30s and 40s. In Catherine's case, it's caused hundreds of small cysts to form on her lungs. So what, what, what happened for you when doctor says that for the first time? Physically, you don't believe what they're saying. I felt perfectly great. I felt perfectly great. I thought, oh, well, this is just an appointment, you know, laughing away. <laughs> and, and then uh, he tells me I've got this, and it was just, I was pretty much probably in shock. The prognosis was you have five to ten years to live. I was scared, sad, you know. She came here, her summer home, to process the news 
and it's where she decided to practice what she preached. Laughter would be her best medicine. Here's my laughter room. Your laughter room. <laughs> there you go. Are you a card shark? Go. <laughs> <laughs> it says, kiss my grass. <laughs> I've given a lot of these away. <laughs> a room full of gag gifts. She packs them into laugh baskets, delivers them to those who need a pick-me-up. She believes this is critical to her health. I was mindful of Viktor Frankl, who said laughter is the currency of hope. And I had been... I had been speaking about the importance of laughter. So here, here you go, little Miss Laughter Lady. I mean, you, it's easy for you to say. Now it was, okay, let's just, you know, take some of your own laughter medicine. But laughter can't cure her. So within months of her diagnosis, she launched Green Eggs and Lamb, an organization dedicated to funding scientific research into the disease. I knew that green eggs and lamb, my goal was to have it not exist. Like it wasn't going to be a... a uh, wasn't, yeah, it was not going to be required anymore. I didn't want to have, start a foundation and have paid staff and audits and all of that. I wanted every cent to go right into the labs. Her first donation came on her birthday when she asked friends and family to donate to lamb research in lieu of gifts. They surprised her, raising over $100,000. That's when she started reaching out to scientists. She invited 30 scientists from around the world to talk about lamb, including Dr. Bill Stanford, a world-renowned stem cell researcher. What do you think? Is Captain Bill, this would be good for him. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's cool. navigating, oh, nice. he's, he's navigating oh. the murky waters of lamb research. <laughs> Ship happens, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stanford, now senior scientist and Canada research chair at Ottawa General, had never heard of lamb before he met Catherine Lawrence. I had received, um, you know, you know, emails for, about other diseases, but never from a patient, right? And, and never from a patient with a sense of humor is <laughs> sending me a basket of, of gag items, you know, f funny uh, glasses and rubber chickens and things like that. So what, like, what did you yeah. think when you got, when you got a, 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 a basket full of rubber chickens? Well, I, so either the person's crazy or, or, or they're really ingenious, you know, to get my attention. Did it get your yeah, attention? Yeah, sure it did. <laughs> Thanks to funding from Green Eggs and Lamb, Stanford assembled a small team of scientists who, in a few short years, made several breakthroughs, including growing lamb-like cells that new drugs can be tested on. These breakthroughs give Stanford hope. A cure for lamb may actually be found in his lifetime, now that other labs around the world are building on their successes. It's kind of like a vaccine, like yes. you, you use... Use um, disease yeah. to trigger right. X. Right. It has the benefit of helping mm. Y. Exactly. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, no. No, no, that, that's exactly the idea. And he marvels that it began with a patient who he now calls a friend. A vivacious person, you know, just living um, life to the fullest uh, and um, happened to have a disease and, um, you know, wanted, wanted to be a part in finding the cure for, for the disease. Really wanted, she was very, taking a very active role. I mean, what patient actually you know, um, starts to organize a, a symposium on, a, on the <laughs> disease that they have? <laughs> but along with the laughter is an undercurrent of urgency for Catherine herself. This is a new addition to Catherine's daily life. Every day she does this to help oxygenate her lungs because her disease is progressing. She was given 10 years to live. She's past that now. Was there a moment that it dawned on you that, that, of, of how sick your friend was? Yeah, when she started pulling around an oxygen suitcase behind her um, when, she was, when I was waiting for her at 
uh, up, at, up at Simcoe and she's walking up and she's got an oxygen suitcase and it's attached and she's walking toward me. Because it's getting harder and harder to draw a simple breath, she's exploring more and more health options, such as Iyengar yoga. It helps open her airwaves. Acupuncture, too, to stimulate blood oxygen. She's also signed up for clinical trials of a drug called rapamycin. It's all helping slow the advance of LAM but not stopping it. She knows the clock is ticking. Her children do too. I want to be there for all their big milestones in their life. I want to be a grandmother. Um, and uh, I'd always envisaged that for me. So I sort of had to, you know, I guess grieve the possibility that that wasn't going to happen. But she's not the type to dwell on her mortality instead remains committed to fundraising for a cure. And word is spreading worldwide, including a surprise donation from England. This is a scrapbook that my great-grandmother made. Her family has <laughs> always had a thing for the royal family. In her teens, Catherine went on a three-month tall ship adventure sponsored by Prince Charles. This year, out of the blue, she received this letter from him, along with a donation for green eggs and lamb. He said, how marvelous that your experience on Operation Drake so inspired you and perhaps helped you somehow to cope with such unimaginable adversity. And when you got this letter, what, what went through your oh. head? Well, I was just moved and um, it, just, it just made me feel like you know, the energy of the universe is so incredible, is that, you know, life circles back to you. We are all connected. We're all connected. And, uh, yeah, it's just nice. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Joan Rivers once said, laughter sometimes comes out of very private tears. Catherine Lawrence's tears aren't hidden away, not at all. She laughs so that the world laughs with her. Duncan McHugh, CBC News, Toronto. Up next, Israel makes dramatic moves on the West Bank. This time it's the right wing that's angry. Time to check today's business numbers. The TSX rose 16 points. The Canadian dollar fell two tenths of a cent. The Dow gained 26 points. The price of oil was up $1.07 a barrel.
Today, the Israeli government moved to evict Jewish settlers from an unauthorized outpost. This as it approves thousands of new settlement units elsewhere in the West Bank. Derek Stoffel was there at the scene of a clash of both policy and people. This Israeli family from Amona decided to get out. But most of the 200 or so residents of this hilltop outpost remained defiant in their homes. As 3,000 Israeli police officers and soldiers descended on their settlement this morning. The men right behind me are supporters of the settlers. They do not live in this community generally. They've come from other settlements in the West Bank and they are showing their resistance to the evacuation order that the police who are just down the road behind me are trying to carry out here. Several protesters were arrested and a number of officers suffered minor injuries as Israeli police faced off against Israeli citizens. Nobody live here, nobody come to here, not Arabs. You see the area, no, no Arabs here. In the whole area, nobody live here before us. It's our land, this is Israel land. Most of the world, including Canada, considers all Jewish settlements in the occupied West Bank to be illegal, a position Israel continues to dispute. But Amona is different. Even the Israeli government and the courts say this outpost is indeed against the law because it was built on private Palestinian land, including a plot owned by Essa Zaid. He says he's been waiting for the evictions for more than 20 years now. In other West Bank settlements, there could soon be more new homes. With the Israeli government approving 3,000 new units late last night, after green lighting thousands more last week. With Amona now set to be demolished, the construction boom is largely seen as a move to appease Israelis on the hard right angered by the sight of bulldozers in their communities. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Amona in the West Bank. NATO is urging Ukraine and pro-Russian separatists to stop fighting. It flared up over the weekend, leaving at least 10 dead and dozens wounded. Heavy weapons fire has left a government-held town in Ukraine with little power or heat. The separatist stronghold of Donetsk was also hit. The White House says President Trump is aware of the situation. The White House had a very clear reaction to confirmation today Iran has tested a medium-range missile. Recent Iranian action. Iran is now feeling emboldened. As of today, we are officially putting Iran on notice. Thank you. Senior officials say the Trump administration is considering a range of options, including sanctions. Iran claims the missile test is permitted under the Nuclear Weapons Accord it signed with the U.S. Now, don't go away. We have steamy shots from Hawaii to show you right after the break.
Well, you're looking at stunning new pictures of Saturn's rings from NASA's Cassini spacecraft. The images show unprecedented detail, giving scientists a better understanding of the icy debris within. Later this year, Cassini will fly between some of those rings before crashing into Saturn's surface and ending its 20-year-long mission. Back here on Earth, more spectacular images. Molten lava from Hawaii's Kilauea volcano is pouring into the ocean. Tour boats are being warned not to get too close. And on a farm in BC, a rare convocation. That's what a group of eagles is called. These bald eagles have made a temporary home there because a nearby composting facility makes for some easy meals. Ah, the bald eagle. It's the best one. That's The National this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.